This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So, having gone through and looked at our, oopsie, uh, we'll carry on. Okay, uh, Chris, you can edit that bit out. So, having gone through and looked at our introduction to the world of hedging, hopefully you've managed to go through and get yourself around the complexities of it. Let me just reiterate what it's all about. It is about ensuring that if we have any gains or losses on a hedging item and gains or losses on a hedging instrument, those gains and losses are offset in the corresponding period within the same financial statements. Okay. And we will elaborate upon that a little bit further now as we go through and first of all look at our hedging with regards to your cash flow hedging. So let's go through first of all and see what we mean by looking at cash flow hedging. Uh, so it's very literal. We're hedging, so that's reducing the risk uh, against cash flow. So here, future cash flow. So if we look at our diagram that we had earlier on within our introduction, uh, we are looking at cash flow hedging. So we're still looking at accounting for the item and the instrument. Uh, here, when we're looking at cash flow hedging, uh, the hedged item are those changes in your future cash flow. So it's something that isn't there within your accounts already. It's something that you, you expect to arise at some point in the future. Now, that could be in the next month or so, six months, 12 months. Uh, the key thing there is that you are subject to risk, the risk and the fluctuations of those future cash flows. So what you do is you enter into a hedging instrument and that hedging instrument is a derivative bet. Okay, That's all a derivative is. Okay, You are going to place a bet on what you expect the outcome of your hedge to be. So if we go through there and just think about what you've got in the notes, okay, a uh, key bit to highlight, I suppose, is the fact that it is a highly probable future cash flow. So it is more likely than not that it is going to go through there and arise. Uh, also, it usually addresses the fear that the asset may rise in value before it is bought by the business. So if you're looking to buy a new non-current asset, if you're looking to go through there and buy some commodity in the future that you're looking to put into your inventory of finished goods, then the fear is of a price rise. And the reason why I emphasize the fear of a price rise, okay, uh, is because that's what we think about when we talk about the derivative. Okay, so just keep that in your mind. Usually a cash flow addresses the fear of a rise in price. OK, so we're always thinking about buying the asset. Don't think about selling it. That could be a potential scenario, but unlikely to be seen. OK, yeah, the fear that the asset will rise in value. If that's the case, you have a cash flow hedge. So you need to be able to identify that you have a cash flow hedge. Once you've identified you have a cash flow hedge, you need to identify the accounting treatment. Now, don't get too carried away with the words effective and ineffective. Uh, the key bit that I want you to understand is that the rules go against any normal accounting rules. They are specific hedge accounting rules and hedge accounting rules for a cash flow hedge. And the rules are as follows. Any gains or losses on the instrument, yeah, on the instrument, so that's the derivative, are recognised in other comprehensive income. So they're sort of hidden away within OCI. Okay. Uh, and then what happens is at some point in the future, when the item is bought, so when you buy the non-current asset, when you buy the commodity or whether you buy your oranges, like we saw in our example earlier, any gain or loss that's hidden away in OCI is recycled in through profit or loss. OK, why? Because once you've bought the item, that is where you realize the gain or loss on the item. So we can match up that hidden loss or gain from OCI into profit or loss. We recognize the purchase of the item and any corresponding gain or loss on it in profit or loss. Okay, so even though you have a derivative, which is the hedging instrument, the usual rules are that gains and losses go through profit or loss on a derivative, but not if that derivative is used as part of a cash flow hedge. Got it? Sure. Okay, good. Ignore it where it starts talking about effective and ineffective. <laughs> yeah, too much. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. Okay, yeah, so the key bit, Gains and losses on the instrument are shown in OCI until the item is bought 
and then we do a bit of recycling okay so there it is there's our example from earlier on okay murphy uh buy a million of oranges uh in three months time we're all worried about the value fluctuating you know the fear is of a rise in price isn't it okay that's what we would be worried about uh, having to pay more for the oranges than what they're worth now Currently, they're at 0.2 million dollars. So we enter into a future, and the future here is that we place a bet on our fear. Okay, so we have a fear of an increase in price. So we place a bet saying that the price will rise. Okay, and that will become clear why as we work through the example. So when you're looking at your derivative, you bet on your fear. Our fear is of a price rise. So what have we got? Let's just think about it with no hedge accounting. Okay, we've touched upon it briefly before. Uh, so the purchase of the oranges, you recognise that when it takes place on the transaction date, when you actually buy them in the future. But with the futures contract, the normal rules for a derivative are that you have gains and losses through profit or loss, wasn't it? Okay, we said there was an accounting mismatch. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through and look at it is if now it is designated as a hedge. That specific purchase of oranges is a highly probable future cash flow. We have a fear of an increase in price. So we have entered into a derivative, which is a bet on an increase in the price. So what we now have is hedge accounting. Now, the accounting for the item doesn't actually change. The purchase of the oranges is still recognised when the transaction takes place at whatever value we pay. However, the key issue that we've got now is that this hedging instrument, the futures contract, the treatment is ever so slightly different because any gains or losses go through other comprehensive income. So we placed a bet on a price rise. If the price goes up, our bet is correct, it is winning, and we have a gain. That gain now goes through OCI. We place that bet, didn't we, on a price rise. If the price goes down, then we've lost our bet. If we've lost our bet, we have a loss. That loss now goes through OCI because the hedging instrument, that futures contract, is part of a cash flow hedge. Okay, They are the rules of hedge accounting and then what happens is that we take that cumulative gain or loss that's stored within OCI and then when we buy the oranges we recycle that gain through profit or loss okay excellent so let's advance our illustration on uh, we just left it didn't we we had was it 0.2 million dollars is what we'd entered into the futures contract for for those 1 million oranges here, we're going to look at what happens at the reporting date within that transaction. If the price is increased at the reporting date to $0.25 million. So, the price has risen. We haven't bought the oranges yet. Okay, but there's a movement on the value of the futures, isn't there? We've placed a bet on the price going up. So, therefore, we are winning our bet, aren't we? Okay, there is a gain. We placed a bet on it going up. It was previously at 0.2. It's now at 0.25. So we've made a gain of 0.05 million dollars, haven't we? So there's a gain of 0.05 million dollars. That's a hedging instrument. That's part of a cash flow hedge. And under cash flow hedges, the gain or loss goes through other comprehensive income. It's hidden away. Okay. Other comprehensive income. What is it? Yeah. People don't pay attention to it, don't they? Okay, it's, it's unrealized at least. Okay, so it doesn't hit profit or loss. Remember, we haven't bought the oranges, so there's nothing recognized yet to do with the purchase of the oranges. To move it on a little bit further, let's say that was at the reporting date. We've now moved it on to just after the reporting date and we buy the oranges. Keep it simple. Best way to deal with it. The oranges are still there at 0.25 million dollars. Yeah. So we buy the oranges at 0.25 million. That's the price that we pay, isn't it? So we purchase the oranges. Yeah, we've actually paid more than what they were originally worth. They were originally worth 0.2, weren't they? So we've essentially made a loss, haven't we, on the purchase of the oranges. But magic, we've made a gain, haven't we, when we close out our futures contract. 
Yeah, we place a bet on the value of the oranges rising. They have risen. We were right. Hurrah. And therefore, we make a gain. So we get some cash in yeah, when we make that gain. That gain of 0 0.05 million is then recycled through profit or loss. And the magic there is that, yes, we record a purchase of 0 0.25 million because that's what we pay for the oranges. But we then net off that gain of 0 0.05 million against the 0 0.25 million purchase price, which gives me a net cost of 0 0.2 million. We have reduced the risk. We've eliminated it entirely. Doesn't matter what happens to the value of oranges. They can go up. They can go down. Okay. But this hedge is 100% effective because whatever gain we have on the contract. Okay. So the hedging instrument. It's equally offset by the loss on the item and vice versa. Okay. A loss on the contract will be offset by a gain on the oranges. If we bought the oranges cheaper. We have placed a bet on the price going up. We've lost our bet. So even though we've got a gain on the oranges, we still have the loss on the bet. And they would net off. Okay. It's keeping it as simple as what it could possibly be. Okay. Uh, it just gives you an idea of how it works and how it all pieces together. Uh, in terms of examples, just to keep an eye out for of what you could get within the exam. In terms of uh, maybe having to identify or think about the accounting treatments. Uh We've just looked at the purchase of oranges, haven't we? Uh, so that's entering into a commodity future to head against a highly probable purchase or sale of a commodity at a future date. We always see things as a purchase of a commodity as opposed to the sale, but IS39 currently goes through there and you know covers both. Uh, we just focus more on the purchase. And also as well, uh, if you have an interest rate swap, uh, so you have gone through there and swapped, is it... Uh, floating or to fixed or, or, or vice versa uh, you are then hedging the future cash flows that the future payment of the interest because if they are variable they may go up you are worried about them going up so you go through there and place a bet on the interest rates going up and then if the interest rates do go up you pay more money on the loan uh, with regards to the interest, but you have a gain on the future, okay? But I just think that's going a little bit too far. What I do is I make sure that you're happy with the basic rules of how cash flow hedge accounting works. Make sure you understand that you know what a cash flow hedge is, uh, and then just make sure you know the examples that we have there. And then as it comes through and you work the exam questions, uh, a little bit of the application of your knowledge will then come to the fore.